Okay. And Kong, you can do your introduction. Do I need to? Well, you should. You haven't done it in a while. <laughs> yeah. So we generally start five minutes after the hour. That's when MIT classes start. So. Right. So we're at 11.05 or so, yeah. <clears throat> so Patrick, is your spectrometer okay these days? Oh yeah, it's running well. Um, the, uh, one, of the, one of the probes we had to ship back to Booker because it uh, had some trouble, but uh, Otherwise, uh, well, they say that that's partially fixed now. So hopefully that will come back, mm. um, but uh, it's running fine. I'm running things right now, uh, I'm told. So mm. actually related to what I'm talking about, uh, it's running right now. So I, I try to obey the rule of fresh results <laughs> or a fresh topic at least. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Art Palmer says hello, Anya. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Aunt. There he is, right? Good morning. Morning. How are you? I'm fine. I'm starting to taper for the Boston Marathon. Uh, <laughs> oh. Will be a hot day then. <laughs> three, di three weeks from yesterday. Okay, that's still some time to get to it. Mm -hmm. oh. So Art, this morning it was 22 degrees. I, I was out in the park running eight miles. Uh, wow, that's nice. Yeah, no, that's, uh, <clears throat> well, it's, it's supposed to warm up, but it's been, it was really cold yesterday and, and today too, so. Uh, we're very nice weather in Europe these days. Mm -hmm. It's uh, really all, awesome. Well, for, for a marathon, you want it to be about 60 or 65 Fahrenheit. Actually, colder than that. Huh? Just under 50 at the start is perfect. Yeah. OK. Yeah. You're getting hot anyway. <laughs> oh, you get very hot. <laughs> so Bill Rogers used to like 60, he said. That was his advertised ideal temperature. Uh -huh. If you remember Bill Rogers. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm feeling overconfident, Bob, because I just ran my fastest half marathon in four years. Oh, well, that's Great. good. How, how fast did you go? 132.21. That's pretty good. So I won the age group for the New York City Marathon. Uh huh. Wow. New York City Half Marathon, New York City Half. Nice. Huh? Congrats. I have to remind myself in Boston, it's another 13 miles after you're halfway done. <laughs> 13.1, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds better in miles than kilometers. <laughs> but the kilometers click off more quickly when you're <laughs> Yeah. So your internal clock counts the kilometers. My internal clock just complains every step of the way. Okay. Oh, well, that's great, Art. You're doing. I wish I could still run. You make me. You make me. Uh, sigh, star, sigh. Mm -hmm. Sad. Huh? But um, that's great. Yeah. Okay. So another thirty seconds or so, and then we can get get moving on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why don't we, uh, 
why don't we get started? All right. Uh, so today we have two excellent talks uh, with uh, oriented towards biological magnetic resonance with magic angle spinning, uh, very fast magic angle spinning and reasonably fast magic angle spinning in the second talk. And so the first speaker uh, today is Anya Bachman from the <clears throat> University of Lyon and um, not the University of Lyon, something in Lyon, right? Some, University some, also, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and Anya was an undergraduate in Berlin. She did her, did her undergraduate work at the Technical University. She got her PhD in biophysics at the uh, University of Paris, Orsay, and was a postdoc with Anne McDermott at Columbia University for a couple of years. And then she moved back uh, to, to France and she's a CNRS research director at the IPC slash MMSB in Lyon, right? Yeah. And she can tell you what the IPCB MMSB stands for during this presentation. <laughs> and our presentation today is, is entitled Making the Invisible Visible, Fast Magic Angle Spinning NMR Reveals the Evasive Hep <clears throat> Hepatitis B Virus Capsid Functional C-Terminal Domain. Okay, so Anya, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bob. So I think you can uh, see my screen here. Yes. And, uh, thanks for this kind invitation. And uh, so the title actually is uh, Making the Invisible Visible, but it doesn't have to do anything with uh, this uh, excited invisible states many people talk in solution about, but it is uh, rather uh, invisible parts of protein that you always miss in your spectra and you never recover anywhere with, with CP or inept in solids and that you really would like to see at some point. Um, so uh, sub, as the subtitle uh, says, this has something to do with our studies on the hepatitis B virus uh, cup seat and it's this uh, collaboration with the group from Bert Meyer in, uh, in Zurich. So all this started uh, at a conference at some point in, uh, in Cuba, where uh, we were sitting through all these virology talks and uh, they, many of them were about this uh, capsid and the, the, the functional part of it. And I asked Beat, I mean, why, why do we never observe this hepatitis B virus capsid protein C terminal domain, which is so important in any CP or NMR or in NMR spectra? And his answer was like, as, uh, as many times before already for other parts, we didn't see, well, it's either broadened beyond detection or it has inefficient polarization transfers. Okay, so that was uh, at, at that point all. But then at another conference, uh, it was in India where, uh, where Madhu organizes these meetings on, uh, on uh, uh, structural biology and NMR where we came back from Kajorao to Delhi in a plane. It was a long flight and long waiting. And uh, there uh, I, was, uh, I was sort of still um, uh, thinking about the crocodiles we have seen in these nice uh, Indian uh, uh, parks. And uh, Beard actually was already starting to explain to me all, the, all, all that I should know to understand this, uh, these missing parts about dynamics and detectors and pulse sequences and light and where it is and where it's not. So it was very, um, I mean, I couldn't get away. So it was uh, at the end, I understood more about it than I, was, I, I did before. And that's how uh, this started. And we took then uh, Morgan Calon and uh, Alexander from Beard's group on board and Lorian uh, from my group and some other people also from, uh, from, other, from, from our labs and Michael Nassal with whom we uh, uh, do these uh, CAPSID studies and started to see, have a closer look uh, at these, uh, these phenomena. Um, so just to say a little bit about the hepatitis B viral particle, how it's assembled and where, where, where the cup seat is actually. So it is uh, uh, the, the hepatitis B virus cup seat is assembled from these uh, dimeric uh, cup seat proteins, which can either assemble uh, in a non-productive manner into these uh, phosphorylated cup seats, which are empty then, or they can to form viral particles. Uh, grab the polymerase here and then uh, the pre-genomic RNA and pack that into the cup seed. This uh, 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 object here then matures and the, the, uh, the polymerase uh, transcribes the viral pre-genomic RNA in a, in a partially double-stranded DNA. 
and the uh, mature bicapsid is then enveloped by three different proteins, uh, which you see here schematized. Uh, they also pack some um, uh, uh, cellular proteins. And then there's a still another maturation step where uh, this, uh, this part here uh, goes outside in order to interact with the cellular receptor, receptor of, the, of the viral particle. Um, here, one part uh, is missing. This is, uh, again, this uh, famous uh, C-terminal domain, which is uh, hanging on this, uh, on this protein here, and uh, uh, it can point outside or inside the cup seat. It is well known that it has to point some, at some point at the outside to interact with cellular proteins, but at the beginning, it's nearly sure that it's interacting and uh, or active in packaging this RNA, and then it's going somewhere as a, as a function of its phosphorylation state actually, and this is a much less well characterized. Uh, so to have a closer look at the, the organization of the cup seat, so uh, the, 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 the box here, the N-terminal assembly domains forms this, uh, this shell here, which is a icosahedral TQL4 cup seat uh, made of 240 copies. Uh, from uh, this uh, uh, this protein, which is a, the, the, the basic unit is a dimer, so it, it's really difficult to get this into a monomer, it's nearly impossible. And uh, you see here the C-terminal domain, which is hanging here. Um, it is uh, uh, from residue 149 to 183. You can see that it has many, many arginines, and it has these serines and threonines where it can be phosphorylated. And this is actually the, the part of this assembly which is, uh, is active in, in, in guiding the, this protein through this, uh, it, its function. And uh, it, it has many different functions actually as a cell, but one is uh, that it's, uh, uh, this, this C-terminal domain is very important for uh, the transport inside the, in, inside the cell. So what we were surprised that when we uh, looked, we first looked only at the assembly domain and it, uh, the cups, it gives beautiful spectra, highly resolved, and uh, it is just, uh, yeah, just have to centrifuge it into an NMR rotor. Um, so it gives, uh, we, we assigned that. And then at some point we looked also at the full length protein. And when you overlay the spectra of the full length protein and of this truncated form, which is, has only the box, you see that uh, there are differences. For example, one prominent difference is that you see the RNA signals in the full length uh, one. So the full length packs when it assembles with the, uh, in, inside the bacteria, it packs E. coli RNA, but you can also disassemble it and reassemble it with pre genomic RNA, for example. There are some small differences. You see one here and one here, but for the rest, uh, the, the spectra, they look nearly identical. So there was no sign whatsoever of this uh, super important C-terminal domain. And we looked actually at a, at a wide variety of capsid forms, at truncated ones, other truncated ones from other genotypes. We purified it higher. We had full lengths, phosphorylated ones, mutant types. Um, everywhere we saw the box, but we never saw this uh, Swiss knife uh, part, uh, which we should have seen because at least, I mean, there are 16 arginines more. So at least in the arginine region, we should have seen something, but we did not. What we saw is a little indication that it was actually there because at some point we thought maybe it's even not present, but uh, you see that uh, some glutamates, which are pointing to the, uh, the inside of the capsid shell here, E43 and E113, they show a different signal when you have the C-terminal domain present, be it in phosphorylated capsids or in uh, the, the RNA-filled ones. So these are the little signs which tell you that there must be something, but uh, this was more or less all. We also uh, recorded at some point proton-detected spectra because we thought maybe it uh, will be uh, different with protons, but it's exactly the same in the arginine region here. You, you can see very nicely the signals of the eight ar arginines in, the, in this uh, 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 truncated domain. Um, in the inept, this is a uh, carbon detected inept. You see also that, the, that you have the RNA peaks in addition. But uh, in the parts where you should see uh, much more signal due to the arginines, they're just not there. You don't observe them, so neither in CP, nor in inept, nor in carbon detected spectra. And I mean, this is not the first time that, that we don't see uh, protein domains in all these kinds of spectra. We had that already in fibrils, or also in other proteins. 
But I mean, here we would really like to see it. So we're, we made an effort to have a look for it. If you don't see a domain, well, what you can always do is just to cool down because uh, and to see uh, if, if, if the signal is there and uh, because uh, we thought this would be a first step. So you can see here spectra at lower temperatures. We went uh, down 268 degrees. And if you uh, um, put the NHs uh, all at the, at the same intensity, because uh, they mainly come from the, from the assembly domain, maybe there they are, they are some more in the, in the other, other domain also, but you see that then you, you, in the arginine region, you really get much more signal for uh, the full length uh, um, uh, protein at low temperatures here, you see there's an increase, a clear increase, and here also for, for these uh, two uh, signals. So at low temperature, the signal is there, but I mean, then we cannot measure any dynamics on that. So we were not satisfied with that, but wanted to go further. And so we had a look at, at these two possibilities a bit uh, uh, from closer. So, so first broaden beyond detection. So that means that your signal is getting, a, a, it keeps the same surface, but it distributes over a wider range. If your noise level is here, then at some point it falls below the noise level and you have these different contributions to the line widths, uh, coherent ones, which depend mainly on the dipolar couplings, uh, which are present, uh, the incoherent ones, which are due to dynamics exchange also. And then you have this inhomogeneous broadening, which comes uh, from distribution of, uh, of, of chemical shifts. Uh, if you have heterogeneity, for example, in the sample, they all add up to give you the total line widths and uh, uh, the, the coherent contributions. I mean, we've seen that in the, in the, in the assembly domain, they, they are not as big as that uh, this would uh, bring any, any uh, line broadening beyond detection. So this is uh, not uh, the, the things which are interested in. Um, the inhomogeneous broad contributions, I mean, at some point, they can only be as broad as the chemical shift distribution of given atoms. So we know also about how broad this, this can be. And we have, for example, seen in fibrils that even if you have a, a rather large chemical shift distribution, normally you still see the signals. So what is about incoherent contributions or uh, exchange? Um, Bea did these uh, uh, simulations. So this is the uh, incoherent protein line width. So it's only the dipolar contribution, which is bigger than the CSA here. And this is a case where you have an order parameter of uh, zero. So this is actually the worst case because you see if you have a, a, a high order parameter, you don't have as much dynamics and you get line widths, which are rather small. And this is calculated as a, as a function of the spinning frequency here. And here you see a sort of a, when, you, when you're at a certain um, uh, dynamics regime here, you get a broadening and this can be maximum, for example, here around 800 Hertz if you spin really slow. If your spinning increases and you're getting narrower and narrower and uh, the hypothetical today, 250, you're really getting under the 100 Hertz. So if you're in, at, at the slow spinning and in the wrong motional regime, you can get quite a lot of broadening uh, if you have a worst case uh, up to uh, several hundreds of, uh, of Hertz. What is about, uh, on the other hand, of this uh, inefficient polarization transfers? I mean, this is uh, something where you can lose signal when you are starting, for example, on the proton spectra. spectrum, you transfer uh, from the proton to the uh, carbon or nitrogen, then you lose signal already. And if you have a further transfer, then you can lose again signal. And if you're unlucky, you're, star you're, you're, you're starting to be below the noise level. And uh, this can be the case if you use a CP or in-app in transfers, which uh, depend on different relaxation times. So when the dipolar couplings are starting to be weak compared to the time you have here, uh, then, uh, then you, you start to, to, to lose a lot of signal in these transfers and everybody has experienced that already with uh, some, uh, some uh, proteins which are not perfectly behaved. So what can we do to, to, to avoid already both cases? I mean, first, if you spin fast, if you go to about 100 kilohertz mass, then, then uh, and this is uh, the, the, what I said to be at first when he explained that to me, I told him, well, I mean, at 100 kilohertz, you should not have more than 200 hertz, even in the worst case. So, I mean, this should be still visible. So let's try to spin fast. And then uh, the, the other point was, I mean, here, 
we couldn't measure these relaxation times uh, on, on, the, on the system because we didn't have any signal to measure it on. But if you assume that T1 is, is always rather long and that this uh, homonuclear mixing uh, would uh, work, then we could, work, could use that and uh, use as few transfers as possible. And those with the best ratio of transfer time to relevant relaxation time, then we should uh, at least be able to observe a signal. If you want to do a proton-proton correlation spectroscopy and you do that on a fully labeled protein, then you run into problems because the dispersion is quite small and the lines are, can be pretty broad still, at uh, even at 100 kilohertz. Moreover, if you're looking at side chains and uh, CH2 protons, so that was where the sample preparation uh, was important. So we, we used uh, these different capsids uh, you see on top here. So empty ones to have a, a reference, the phosphorylated ones to see what the C-terminal domain does when it's phosphorylated, the uh, pgRNA, pregenomic RNA filled ones to see uh, how it behaves when it is an interaction with the RNA. Uh, then E. coli ones also, which you which just pack E. coli RNA, and then also just to test another RNA, we use yeast RNA also, which is commercially available. So the PG RNA we make it ourselves, so we uh, uh, we we can uh, then introduce it by DS disassembly and reassembly as also the yeast RNA. So in order to observe some signals, uh, well, this was done in E. coli expression, so this is a rather classical thing. Uh, we made the proteins in D2O, so uh, the, the, if you do that, you get uh, all the uh, protons uh, um, in a deuterated form. So we use the deuterated glucose in addition, so then you have really everything, but then we are reversely labeled with protonated C13 and 15 arginine. Uh, you can do that, you can just add arginine uh, to the growth medium because this is at the end station and this is a one-way street here, I don't know if you see that. So uh, it does not scramble with any other uh, members of this, uh, of this uh, uh, metro line here, where you see these, uh, these uh, uh, um, metabolic uh, schemes here. And as you have 16 arginines in the C-terminal domain and only seven in the N-terminal domain, we should uh, be able to, uh, uh, to observe. Uh, the, the, if we get signals, then we can probably, by comparing to CP149, say whether they are coming from the C-terminal domain. This uh, scheme also has the advantage to reduce the, 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 proton, the proton density in the sample, so which should then be beneficial also to, to, get the, to, to reduce the coherent part of the, of the line width. And indeed, we, we get uh, spectra. So uh, you see here the first spectra we recorded on the, on the assembly domain alone here, and then uh, on the phosphorylated and on the uh, uh, pgRNA capsid. And uh, you can see that here you have some uh, weak peaks. I, I indicated the frequencies with these uh, lines here where you expect uh, uh, arginine resonances. And you get actually very strong uh, peaks here in these uh, C-terminal domain containing capsids, which you can see here. The samples are in D2O, so this helps for water suppression. And you can see that somewhere you have, a, sometimes you have a bit residual protonation because it was, uh, it was not enough D2O maybe, but see that it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty clean here. And we also have some, unfortunately, some DSS peaks. Since then, we do not add any DSS anymore because it's, it's really in proton spectra. It's getting really annoying. But you see that the, the peaks are there. We see the arginines. And you can see also that uh, here it's the H alpha uh, of, the, of the arginine here at four point something. And you see that in the assembly domain, the resonances of this, this H alpha, they are clearly different uh, from this major peak you have here. So this is the first indication that what we see here is really the arginines uh, from the C-terminal domain. And here we have the arginines, which chemical shifts we have assigned already before from the assembly domain. Here you see a zoom, so these are uh, the assigned peaks. And you can see here again, uh, the, this is, these are the side chain protons here, and uh, these are DSS uh, things. So these arginine peaks uh, we observe here are thus clearly stemming uh, from a majority of the C-terminal domain. You can see that also when you do uh, uh, 1D trace or 1Ds, you have the amide region, is, which is more or less the same here. And then you have an increase, a clear increase in the uh, 
C-terminal domain containing samples at these frequencies here, which uh, really says that this is uh, uh, the um, um, the arginines from the C-terminal domain. So the spin diffusion NOE, NOE scheme at uh, with the 50 millisecond mixing time worked really, really well. You see here a trace from the spectrum. You see that the transfers uh, they are quite well if you compare that to the to the to the, uh, the reference here of the empty cup seats. And uh, here you can see also the 1D trace uh, of uh, of uh, 1D CP of the of the N terminal domain alone. And you see indeed that the the, the H alpha signals from the N terminal domain from the assembly domain are clearly at a different chemical shift than these uh, signals you see here from the H alpha and the H betas. So this was really what we were looking for. So now we could measure relaxation uh, measure, uh, we could, could determine relaxation times on this. And uh, here you can again see the color code for the different cup seats. And you see that the relaxation uh, re, uh, times for the uh, empty cup seats or the, the arginine resonances from the assembly domain are longer than the other ones, uh, which uh, group uh, rather at the at the uh, at around the same values. You can see also this is the diagonal peaks here, and these are the cross peaks. You see that the cross peaks, they, they relax, relax much faster. This is because in the diagonal peak, you have the contribution still of these uh, um, N-terminal domain peaks also in the, in the diagonal. But in the cross peak, you seem to really see mainly the, the cross peaks from the uh, C-terminal domain, and the relaxation here is quite fa much faster than uh, you have uh, for, for this one here. This is T1 row here. This is uh, T2. It's the uh, same picture, more or less. You have quite fast relaxation times here uh, for the, the, the cross peaks, which indicates that the, 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 the pulsation is not so uh, long lived. It's plotted here as, uh, as bar plots uh, T2 prime here, T1 row. This is the prime is superflu here. And you have, you have the line widths also, and you see that the, the T2s are really, and T1 rows are rather short, and the lines are rather broad. They are around uh, 200 and 300 uh, hertz here for the uh, side chains. So what was interesting also, and this is a bit of a side, uh, uh, side thing, that we did not only observe uh, the, the C-terminal domain, but we also could uh, evidence its interactions with the RNA. And actually, uh, you see here, this is this PGRNA sample where we disassemble the capsid and we reassemble with the in vitro prepared RNA. So the RNA is protonated. This one is commercial RNA. This is protonated also. And here you have the E. coli RNA, which is deuterated. So you see that here you do not see any peaks uh, at this uh, uh, frequency, which is, uh, can be assigned to the RNA. And here, and where the RNA is protonated, you see clearly at the arginine frequencies here, the cross peaks with the RNA. You also see RNA-RNA correlations, which you have here, for example. But these peaks, even if they are weak, they clearly present a sign of the interactions with between the arginines and the RNA. So, okay, now, I mean, we have 2D proton spectra, which uh, as everybody knows in NMR are not the thing you would like to work with because there's a, a lot of overlap. And if you're not select labeled, then uh, it's, it's getting really tough at some point. Uh, so it doesn't get you very far. So we wanted to use the knowledge we gained on relaxation times to implement optimal parameters and go back to CP and inept. And uh, so we have for this uh, uh, to shorten the, the CP time, if you, we would like to try to do this, or so we have to here make uh, this uh, tau one uh, smaller than the uh, relaxation time, the T2 prime. So first, what's about short CP? So we try to implement that. And you can see here the different spectra again, the assembly domain, phosphorylate and pgRNA containing capsids. And unfortunately, you see that they're all the same. So this does not work. Uh, so the dipolar couplings are clearly too small to transfer during these uh, reduced uh, uh, CP times, which you have when you choose the, 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 the time according to the T1 row you have available. Uh, so this is not an option. Um, what is about the inept? So you have to choose these times rather short and then you run into problems also because transfers are not really well anymore. Uh, so first, uh, we thought, okay, uh, a refocused in-app where you can implement Mississippi, for example, at, at this place, which is an important thing. 
um, get rid of all these uh, uh, many uh, times you have here and just reduce it to the, the normal inept where you cannot do water suppression. So we did that as the proton proton correlation spectra also in, uh, in D2O then. But first, uh, uh, we looked at the, at the theoretical curves and uh, to look uh, whether um, what are the, 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 the tasks you need to, to use if you have, for example, no relaxation, you're best off here. And then if, you, uh, if you're going, getting uh, shorter, you are, you're going uh, to left here. And for the CH, uh, uh, if you have a J coupling on, on, of this order of magnitude, you are then a, around a, a bit more than one millisecond. And you see also that uh, this is the refocused inept. So uh, you are then here. So you lose uh, uh, over a factor of two if you do the refocused inept instead. And it's also much better to use CH than to use NH because you see that here you, you, are, you are really down on, on, uh, on, on near to nothing. So that was an important information and we got it here. So you see the uh, carbon uh, proton correlation spectrum here of the assembly domain alone. And here you see that finally we have these cross peaks for the H gamma here, the uh, beta here, the delta is overlap, but you see that these peaks are more, much more intense in the C-terminal containing capsids. And you even see uh, weak uh, correlations here with the, uh, the C alpha, H alpha. Uh, which you do not see here. So these are the other residues from the N-terminal domain, which have been, which are present here also in the inept. So that was the first time then we got uh, the signals from the C-terminal domain also in heteronuclear correlation spectra. So then as we knew that this proton-proton uh, uh, mixing time uh, gives a transfer also, uh, we implemented that in addition. And uh, you can see here again that uh, you can indeed transfer from these uh, H beta that they belong to this frequency here. And you can see also that you can transfer until the H alpha and actually these chemical shifts you have here for the H alpha, they clearly coincide with the ones you see in the proton proton chemical uh, uh, shift correlation spectra. And you see uh, again that these uh, uh, C gammas here, they are clearly different from the ones in the assembly domain. So this is uh, clearly not something which stems from these residues. So we were there. What does that mean now? I mean, uh, what was surprising to us because uh, we thought at the, at the beginning and I think many biologists also thought that, that these phosphorylated capsids actually have these C-terminal domains which are just hanging around and have a different dynamics as compared when they are with the RNA and when they make interactions with the phosphate backbone. However, what we have seen here is that the uh, first, they are all random coils. So there's, there are no, uh, no defined secondary structure which are built by these things. And they have both comparable by dynamics. So actually these here, they must interact also probably in an intermolecular manner uh, between the phosphorylated serines and threonines and the arginine side chains. So this, uh, these C terminals are actually, they, they must form some, some, some sort of uh, inner layer here on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the inner of the cup seat, which is however as, a, as intermediate dynamic as uh, this one here also. So just to finish on some words why this is important actually, when you, when you imagine capsid trafficking into, in the cell, then this is not taking place uh, like this, but it is actually more um, like a, a, a draw truck. It's a C-terminal domain, which is taken on the, on, on the, on the truck and it uh, tears the, uh, the, the rest of the capsid. And this is, for example, if you have the, the virus which is entering the cell, then the, the cup seat is, uh, is uh, laying uh, open. And then it's taken in charge by uh, DNA, by the LL1 uh, protein, and it is transported in, uh, uh, near the nucleus. And then it's taken into charge by importine, uh, which then transports it to the nuclear pore so it can go into the, into the nucleus and then uh, uh, continue its path. And uh, we would like to study these interactions actually. And for this, uh, you see them here as modeled by uh, using alpha fold. I mean, these uh, complexes are not uh, known today how they interact. So you see here the C-terminal domain with importine, which uh, uh, is probably somewhere here, uh, interacting with, the, with these, uh, this uh, uh, cleft here. 
for dunein uh, it's uh, it's looking like it's not uh, not the citron in itself but the linker more or less the linker region here but this is a, as i told you it's just a model but what we need to know before studying this is which type of cup seeds uh, has a dynamic sea turtle domain, which type of cup seed exposes the sea turtle domain, and which, in which case it can interact with these proteins, because if it's held inside the cup seed by either the phosphorylated form or the pgRNA, then you will never have an interaction with these uh, uh, things. So this is something we would like to do next, and I will stop here, and uh, I would like to Thank again the, the people who worked on that. So Morgan and Alex, they uh, took all of the, uh, the fast mass spectra. Lorian did the uh, low temperature uh, measurements with Thomas Bauer. Uh, and uh, Marie and uh, Marie-Laure and Shishan made samples. And Martin also recorded spectra. And this was all a collaboration with uh, Beat, who is obviously very important here also. So thank you for your uh, attention. And uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. Okay, <clears throat> Anya, thank you very much. That was a really uh, impressive array of biochemistry as well as NMR methodology. Uh, and there is one question uh, already here uh, from Christoph uh, Rohe, I guess. Is, and it says, thank you for the very interesting results. Uh, which NOE mixing times did you use? We use different ones. We made build-up curves also, and uh, it's uh, around uh, 50 milliseconds where you have best transfers for these uh, uh, flexible parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> why didn't you, uh, I mean, so, so you, you were able to see when you went to lower temperatures, when you got to minus 168, I think, was the temperature. Yeah. You did start to see carbon resonances, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why didn't you pursue that further? I mean, they, the resolution did look so bad in the spectra. Were you spinning, and what was your spinning frequency there? Probably 20 kilohertz, right? Or yeah, that was, uh, it was in uh, 1.3, I think. So it was, uh, it, no, it was in the 3.2, yeah. Um, so the peaks are still rather large. And what you cannot do then is to measure dynamics. I mean, you want to know when this domain is flexible, when it's available, when it's uh, in interaction with something. And so at low temperatures, this, is, um, this was not an option. Uh -huh. But you could see what it was interacting with in those. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, it looked promising. So, uh, <clears throat> so Art Palmer has a question too. Uh, I missed how you got the side chain assignments. Did you relay to the backbone? Uh, yes, uh, the, we didn't get the uh, site specific assignments uh, directly, but we uh, we actually, if you look uh, here, then you can relate to the backbone H alphas here. So, but this is, this peak represents all of the arginines in the C terminal domain. I mean, this, there's no resolution uh, to, a, to a single arginine there. I mean, we do not know how many of them we see and which ones ex exactly we see. That. So for the C terminal domain ones, there's no site specific assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, and Christian Griesender <coughs> has a question. He says, uh, since the C terminus is flexible, uh, could you increase the temperature to even better observe it in the NAPT type experiments? And what about TROZI type experiments? Yeah, increasing temperature is always a, a risk because at some point the capsid is not stable over time anymore. I mean, if you go to, to 25, 30 degrees, then uh, it's uh, or much over that, it's, it's not stable anymore. And the proton experiments are actually uh, done at, uh, at the higher temperature because you cannot go as low as five degrees where you do the carbon detection. So, um, and we didn't see even in the proton detected spectra, we didn't see anything. Uh, Trosi in solids, um, I'm not a specialist in that and I don't think it uh, will work. Well, if you had a liquid like spectrum, Christian, yeah, you but want that's to something on that? have. Christian, do you want to uh, join the conversation? No. Maybe not. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yes. Uh, I mean, in, in principle, if INAP works, then um, also, I mean, all the liquid state experiments should 
should work, I, I would have thought, but maybe not. But, but I mean, if the lines are too broad and you, you don't have a separation of the, of, the, of the things, then I don't think that that works. But I mean, I'm not a specialist. But, but if in a, I mean, in a, you also have um, the antiphase um, somehow. So, so in, in principle, then, um, that's a, or, or, or crypture or something like that. I mean, they, they are all around. But OK, I mean, um, maybe we should discuss in. in well, that's an interesting thing. Maybe Beard wants to say something to that because he's here also. So, well, I can't add so much. I mean, in principle, it's true that if if you have a lot of motion, you can look at it as as in solution. It's not solid state anymore, spectroscopy anymore, and you could try to to see these effects. We have never seen them, and it has to do with the fact that we are still, I think, in a in a regime where trosy doesn't, doesn't work. But of course, you could hope in, in some case that you could see it. But I don't think in this cap seat it's possible. Well, I have then maybe another question. I mean, you mentioned that at uh, 25 and so on, the, the cap seat becomes, um, now becomes uh, unstable, but it has to somehow survive in the, in at 37 degrees, right? And the liver, I think, is even a little bit hotter than the rest of the body. So, so <laughs> yeah, but well, you don't have it in do isolation. Yeah, I mean, it starts to aggregate at some point. You see peaks in the spectra which were not there before. So, okay. Uh, okay. Right. <clears throat> Lauren Andreas has a, a question. Uh, great talk, he says. What is the evidence that important or another interminal residue or NTR? is necessary for entry into the nucleus. Um, what, uh, instead, right, why important is, uh, is, is important to get into the, yeah, I think, I mean, this has been done in cells and uh, it, uh, it has been shown by, by people that uh, this, the, the, the trafficking into the cell, that the cell nucleus is done by importing alpha and it does also connect uh, to importing beta under some conditions, but uh, you need importing alpha for, for infectious, uh, to beat infectious. And uh, a final question is very nice talk from Thomas Vegan. Uh, <clears throat> how would you imagine uh, does the RNA arginine interaction look like? Hydrogen bonding to the phosphate backbone? Uh, do you have any indications from the cross peaks uh, you have observed in the proton proton spectra? Yeah, I think this is uh, uh, probably with the phosphate backbone because we didn't see any uh, any correlation with the sugars and uh, we didn't see uh, any correlation with the bases. So, and the bases you see them a lot in the uh, in the inept spectra. Actually, they they seem to be rather mobile, and the sugar backbone is uh, with the phosphates on it is uh, rather the, the the more rigid part. So, it's probably, but this is something we would like to address in in the future. So. So if you go back to your, <clears throat> go back to the question, I guess I raised at the beginning at the minus 168, uh, that's pretty low for a, uh, what, for a 3.2 Bruker probe, right? Yeah, that was the, the, the setup Thomas Bauer used at that time to do all these very low temperature things also on, uh, on head S. I don't know if you remember these papers. Yeah. 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 And, 1.3. Okay, was it was it 1.3 actually? Sorry. Okay, yeah. No. All right. And uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we published a paper on bacteria rhodopsin quite some time ago. It was a DNP paper, but we looked at the arginine. It was an arginine label sample with arginine. It was in 15 carbon correlation. It, the spectra were really very well resolved. Um, I mean, you could see. Uh, I think there's seven arginines in bacteria rhodopsin, and you could see every one of them. Now that's not, you have what, nine plus 16 or something like that? Seven plus 16, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it might be worth looking at the, the nitrogen. The, I mean, the arginine resonance are out all by themselves, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think I think we will not forget that. I mean, the setup doesn't uh, is at one point three, so we will we'll have to to set this uh, up again. But uh, I think we will uh, look in this direction at some point when we do interactions, and maybe because interactions will be definitely easier when you go to low temperatures. Also, I guess. I mean, 
let's see how this works, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that was a really nice presentation. Very nice talk, beautiful results. And Thank you. So let's go on to <clears throat> the second presentation. Kong, do you have any questions? I should have asked. Uh, oh, so, uh, okay. I, I just have a short question. So, I, uh, so I'm just curious. So you were spinning at the 100 or 110 using a 0 0.7, and then you were mixing like for 15 milliseconds for the proton-proton mixing. So I, I'm just wondering, like, I mean, I, I don't know, like, is, is your plan to go faster and faster, 165 or even higher? And at this fast spinning regimes, would your proton-proton mixing be less efficient? So would you go to mixing longer time? I was just wondering, like, you know, I would expect like it, uh, the the proton proton mixing will become less efficient, and as uh, some, good, yeah. it's a good question. And I mean, I, I must admit also that it's not so hundred percent clear how the mechanism is uh, of the transfer during this time. I mean, so this will be interesting to to have a look at that definitely. Okay, so I'm just wondering if you or Bia is trying to design a new power sequence that will work at much faster spinning. Or proton proton something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a quick question or comment. Okay, thanks. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so our <clears throat> second speaker today uh, is Professor Patrick Vanderbilt uh, from Göttingen uh, University, and uh, Patrick was an undergraduate in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, and then he transferred or traveled to the U.S. to the University of Arkansas in Petville, right? my favorite town, one of my favorite towns, uh, where he did his PhD in biochemistry uh, with Roger Kepi. And then he was a postdoc here in our group at MIT for a few years. And then he uh, took a position at the University of Pittsburgh uh, <clears throat> in the School of Medicine. And then most recently, he moved back to Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, and he's in the uh, Zernike Institute for Advanced Materials uh, and today he's going to tell us about dynamic based solid state NMR studies of solvent facing interfaces of biomolecular assemblies. All right, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bob. And thanks for the, the great chance to um, yeah, share a bit about our ongoing work in this, this area. And um, the, uh, uh, if you, that's one second, I have some. Can you see that okay? Yeah, it's fine, yeah. Um, yeah, so the the introduction actually uh, in the previous talk is uh, basically perfect, couldn't orchestrate it better because um, what I'll talk about also is a bit about facing the um, the interface of yeah, rigid and, and uh, dynamic uh, components of the signal and how do we address that and I, um, yeah, we're, we're looking at various different aspects of this. And I ended up with a bit of generic title, but I'll, I'll talk about one aspect of our work uh, here that actually, like I said, connects really well to the, to the previous presentation. And the work that I'll talk about this today is mostly done by my uh, postdoc, Irina Matlahov, who I think is here in the audience as well, um, and has uh, been working on our Huntington uh, polylutamine uh, research projects. Uh, as I think many of you know, that's one of the things that my group has been working on for the last, um, well, now 10 plus years. And I started that in Pittsburgh, working with uh, Ronald Wetzel, who has uh, really uh, uh, yeah, been at the forefront of, of studying the biophysics or structural work um, of aggregation by proteins in this disease. And what I have here as a relatively short introduction of to this disease, but it's one of these neurodegenerative diseases where people show uh, brain de degeneration, even pre-symptomatic. This is an MRI measured uh, before symptoms take on and you already see extensive brain damage in this patient. And what's going on in these patients with Huntington's disease is that they have a mutation in the protein Huntington and uh, they are fine for much of their life, but in the later stages of life, they start to get this progressive disease that is currently incurable um, and uh, ultimately fatal. And uh, the disease onset tracks with the uh, type of the uh, mutation. And in particular, if you look at the Huntington protein, it's a, a large protein of more than 3,000 residues, for which now there is a um, electron microscopy structure available from different groups. 
Um, but in the, um, are you still seeing me? I, I, does my something disappeared? But I assume it's it's okay. Um, okay. Uh, the the what you can see in this picture is a structure from electron microscopy, the space filling model. And what they modeled here is the N terminus that they don't see in the uh, EM structure because it's a flexible disordered segment. And it's this disordered segment, uh, an invisible structure <laughs> to re recount the previous presentation that is actually uh, mutated. And when it's mutated, it undergoes aggregation uh, upon cleavage from the main protein. So these fragments are found in patients and they also aggregate quite nicely in vitro and they form amyloid-like fibers. And what my group has been interested in <clears throat> is to try and understand the, uh, the biophysics of aggregation, but also the structure specifically of these aggregated proteins. And we have been working on this since uh, our first publication in 2010. Um, and most recently, uh, work from uh, Jennifer Boats, which who was a PhD student in my group in uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, we published our latest uh, structural model of what these fibers look like based on an integration of NMR and other methods. And she also did a fair bit of, of EM. And I like to show this picture because it shows that this one protein forms all these different types of fibers depending on the conditions and that these fibers are co-assembled from different filaments that stick together. But always the core structure, this green thing here is made by the part of the protein that's mutated. And, I, and I'll get to that in one second. So that's a uh, polyglutamine or polyq core, which probably many of you have seen me, me talk about before. And, and also a few of our colleagues are working on these kinds of uh, polyq proteins. Um, and what we have shown is that the, the core of these fibers is made up, these are red and blue arrows, is this polyglutamine domain. So in our proteins, we use uh, typically 44 glutamines uh, in that domain, which is also what most of the patients have. And then they form uh, a beta sheet based core in the middle of the fibers at you can study the um, dimensions with uh, x-ray diffraction. <laughs> and we can see the overall width of the fibers with uh, electron microscopy. And then if you integrate that with atomic structural methods, which I won't talk about here, but we've published uh, in the past how among other things, we've used torsion angle measurements to try and tackle the structure of this uh, polycule. Um, and we've used quite a bit of information from studying the dynamics of segments on the surface of the fibers. And by combining all this information together, you can start to build a model uh, of uh, what, what this uh, structure looks like. And we're uh, working towards uh, taking this really to the atomic level right now. But what I, I don't really want to talk about that in detail now, but for the rest of my talk, it's a bit interest, a bit important to mention or to kind of give you a feeling for what the fiber looks like. So what we have is that we think that the core is made up by these blue and red parts, which is the poly Q. And that's if you look at the protein sequence that's shown here. So we have an uh, N-terminal segment, which is called N17 in some cases, which is dot, doesn't contain the glutamines, the Q. And then there's a long Q stretch, in our case, 44 Qs. And then it's followed by the proline rich domain, which has whole segments of prolines, uh, which then in our uh, final structure form PP2 helices. So quite well ordered uh, structural elements, but they're on the surface of the fiber. And what we can see in our in a NMR is really that these surface facing domains are quite dynamic and the core looks really like a crystalline type structure and we've done we've determined that based on uh, relaxation measurements of n15 and carbon well, partially or largely done in collaboration with other groups also uh, order parameter measurements with uh, of course kind of dip shift type experiments um, and so we and also looking at things like pdsd buildup curves that you see that by all intents and purposes core of these fibers, even hydrated samples, looks really like a crystalline lattice. And the surface looks much more dynamic. Um, and it's particularly the surface that we're now also interested in. Because when you look at these kind of fibers in a uh, patient or in a cellular environment, what you realize is that what's inside the fiber, so if I go back, what's buried inside this core of the fiber is not accessible to the cell. So it doesn't in a way, it sort of doesn't play a role in the biology. But what's on the surface, either the surface of the polycue here or these segments that stick out the side, 
these are the sites where the, the cell can interact with these fibers. And so there's a lot of interest in what's going on there because you have their ubiquitination sites that play a role in degradation of the fibers. You could have chaperones that act on these fibers and it's now known, I mean, it's not on the slide, that different chaperones, not just this trick chaperone, but other ones bind to these protein rich domains, for example, but also other proteins from the cell could get trapped on or uh, in these fibers, which could then uh, relate to damage to the cell because you remove essential proteins. But what I boxed here is that there are also key things that are really implicating the polyglutamine surface of the fiber. So what we're talking about here is that you um, uh, can have uh, incoming proteins, they can trigger further aggregation on the poly-Q surface. Uh, you could have other proteins sticking to that surface, or you could have things like these thioflavin T or Congo red dyes or PET tracers that recognize the surface features of these uh, fibers. So there's quite a bit of interest in studying uh, the surfaces of the fibers. But one of the challenges is that, of course, in our case, every single residue in this blue-red core is made out of a glutamine. And that if you look at the glutamine NMR signals, they're very st strong signals of the, uh, we see two peaks. So one is the, the A form, the red arrows, and one is the B form. And they together form, uh, by our account, 90% of the structure of this fiber. And the remaining 10% is then, uh, at least in part, the fiber surface, which we're interested in. So that raises the challenge of like, okay, how do we pick out the features of this fiber surface, either these flanking domains or the, especially the glutamines on the fiber surface? And that's one of the things that we're looking at. So as already introduced uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in Anya's talk, we can, of course, use uh, CP-based methods to see the fibers. Uh, and their core, and we can use inept-based uh, ineptopsy methods to look at the uh, segments on the fiber surface. And what you see here, as uh, nicely discussed, is the really, really flexible parts of the fiber, uh, the C-terminal tail of this protein. And here we see the core plus a bunch of other amino acids that are uh, surrounding the, the core, where we know that these uh, poly-Q themselves they form the most rigid part of, this, uh, of the surface, this, like in this diagram, the, the green parts of the fiber. And it's these red bits that we see in the inept spectra, only the really, really flexible stuff. And then we see intermediate motion for a bunch of other features of the protein, including this uh, N-terminal segment, this N17 segment, this marked here as HTTNT. And then we also see, which will be a bit relevant later on, if we see these PP2 helices, so that's the segments where we have here 11 proteins in a row, for example, or here 10 proteins in a row, marked in this figure as the light blue helices. And we see proteins that are random coil, which are more isolated proteins in the C-terminal part. So we see two separate signals, and you can see it here in two different polymorphs of the fibers. We see them a bit different. Now, if you look at this, you see based on a whole variety of measures that this poly-Q is, is really, like I've said now several times, really super rigid. And indeed that these 40 fewer Qs are, first of all, make up a large part of the protein, but they also, because of their rigidity, they really dominate any of our CP-based spectra. On the other hand, we are quite interested in all these other peaks that are from other parts of the protein uh, that are outside the core. So they're uh, semi-rigid, so they must be semi-rigid, otherwise we wouldn't see them in the CP. Um, but uh, they have reduced order parameters, and we've, we've seen that in various experiments. Um, and they also experience faster relaxation. Now, one of the tricks that I uh, was going to discuss then, of course, is that if you're trying to see more of these signals that are kind of semi-rigid, you could think, just like beautifully introduced just now, oh, well, we cool the sample down and we then eliminate some of this motion so that we can start to see these signals more clearly. And then we talked about some of this with our um, previous work on cytochrome C bound to the surfaces of protein of uh, membranes, where we also saw that the protein without cooling is utterly invisible. And then when you cool the sample down, you suddenly see these peaks coming up in the CP spectra and we could study it. And what we discussed there in these and, and subsequent papers is that by controlling the temperature carefully, we felt like we had the protein on the membrane surface in this layer of uh, still 
largely liquid water, but the, the rest of the sample was frozen, and you reached the sort of uh, sweet spot for uh, immobilizing the protein enough to see it in the CP NMR, but not so much that you start broadening the spectra. But I just wanted to introduce this here uh, as kind of one way that you could try to address this, and indeed we try to do this here. And then for these experiments, where we looked at the cytochrom C, and, and I would refer to our work on this topic if you're interested, we saw um, this, uh, or we analyzed what's going on partially by observing the proton signal of the water phase where you see it remaining fluid at 20 degrees or even minus nine degree. And then it starts to freeze when you go down to much colder temperatures. And then as you go through these transitions, you see the protein signal come up uh, showing that it's solvent coupled to dynam dynamics. And of course, when we published this, we quite amply and, and clearly cited Anya's work. Uh, we did done a lot of nice work on looking at uh, water in crystalline proteins and so on, uh, and seeing also this um, so, uh, freezing point depression in uh, solid state in MR samples. Um, now, recently, my one mention of some, on, some new projects in our lab relate to studying the same kind of ideas in uh, hydrogel, specifically polysaccharide and alginate hydrogels. And we just recently published this in the, the journal Food Hydrocolloids, the work by my uh, PhD student, uh, Mustafa, who uh, looked quite extensively at water molecules in, in hydrogels uh, and their different dynamic properties based on relaxation measurements. But uh, I want get, to get back here in this talk to our um, amyloid fiber. So what we tried to do here is, is look at these semi-dynamic signals on the surface of the fiber core, um, uh, which is challenging in the presence of these strong signals from the rigid components of the fiber. And so one of the things you can try is to do this cooling. So go from uh, temperature around uh, zero degrees Celsius to lower temperatures where at some point when you reach below, in this case, 270 Kelvin, we freeze the water. So this is the water signal at 277, 270, 263, and 256. And you see that at some point the signal collapses because it freezes. And indeed you see that the CP signals then start to increase. So this dashed line shows the intensity of the C alpha, so the glutamines here, and it stays the same and you go down a little bit and then it starts to increase. So you see that freezing the water indeed helps to uh, increase the CP signal. And you see that some of the dynamic signals start to go uh, get more intense. So the proteins here also get more intense on the fiber surface. But you also immediately see, as you may not, may not be that surprised, that, that also a lot of the interesting features of interesting peaks, this random coil proline signal starts to kind of blur away because the signals broaden out and we freeze it. And uh, uh, these are not cryoprotected samples to anticipate that question, but we, uh, I don't think that that would make a tremendous difference. And I use this more as an introduction to the experiments I want to talk about uh, as the main point here, but really using these low temperature measurements don't really help tremendously in fixing this problem. And you can look at this also with 2D spectra. So this is the 2D spectrum of our uh, fiber, carbon-carbon DAR spectrum, 25 milliseconds uh, DAR mixing uh, uh, without freezing it and with freezing it. And what you see is that the uh, signals in the core, this, these are the poly Q signals, that they basically stay immune to what happens to the water freezing. And you see that the proline signals, they change and they broaden um, and they get more intense too, like you see improved transfer. But it doesn't really help us to start to understand what's going on with signals of glutamines that are not in the core because you're just freezing everything more. And uh, we, yeah, we don't really gain that much, except maybe to be kind of further convinced that these uh, poly-Q core signals are not sensitive to the solvent and so are protected from solvent interactions. So one of the things that we then started thinking about, partially inspired by having done some dip shift experiments to try and measure these uh, dynamics, is to see, well, what if we want to see these semi-dynamic states, which have a low order parameter, uh, in presence of these really rigid signals, could we deface the uh, rigid components with a dip shift dipolar filter and then integrate that into a uh, 2D experiment, like a DAR experiment, and thereby get a DAR just for the core, of, the, of just for the surface of the fiber. And that's basically the main thing I want to briefly talk about. And this is something that we're finishing up a manuscript and probably will post soon to a bio archive. Um, so 
we had done in the past, and for this paper, we repeated uh, some uh, dip shift experiments here using, uh, I think this is the R1817 sequence for the recoupling of carbon protons. So this is focused on C alpha, so uh, H alpha C alpha interactions. And for some of the prolines, which are also CH groups. And what you see is that in the unfrozen sample, you see that the, uh, you could clear dipolar oscillations for the glutamines in the core. So the two A and B forms of the glutamine. But if you look at the prolines, they decay in one sort of smooth line. And if you try to simulate this, then just simulating the reduced order parameters doesn't quite get you to that line shape, like this dephasing curve. But you have to integrate also uh, not just a reduced order parameter, but also that there's some relaxation going on. And that fits then to the order parameter here being in the range of 0.1 or 0.2. So quite quite low, so you have a lot of motion. And then if you freeze the sample, what you see is that, the, of course, again, the glutamines don't change much in their, their polar uh, oscillations. But in the prolines, we can start to now see the same kind of dipolar oscillations once the sample is frozen, showing that freezing the sample immobilizes the, uh, um, the proline segments, but also that, indeed, this line shape was stemming from uh, uh, the, the effect of motion and solvent coupled motion specifically. So if we now integrate these findings uh, with the fact that you see these curves hitting a zero point here near 0 0.2 millisecond mixing with this idea of having this uh, kind of filtered experiment, what you can then do is do an experiment where you do a DAR either without mix, without this kind of filter or with the filter. And here it's actually set up so that the signals from the rigid components show up as negative peaks, uh, shown here with a different color, uh, whereas the blue peaks are stemming from those signals, which have not defaced properly. And you can see that here. So if we look at these curves near 0.2 milliseconds, you see that the glutamines are near zero. And near 0.2 milliseconds, there's still uh, 50 to 70% signal left for the prolines, for example. And indeed, that's what we see here. You see that the proline peaks are still there, but the uh, glutamine signals are defaced or even negative. Um, and so what you can see now is that close to these really strong glutamine signals from the core, there actually were some peaks nearby from glutamines, which we could previously not see. You could call them invisible, if you will, um, and that now show up. And I, I put a few slides that kind of walk this through a little bit more one by one. So we see these um, uh, colored peaks from the uh, rigid uh, components, which in this particular fiber is just the glutamines. And uh, you see that the other peaks that still remain must be the semi-rigid signals. Now remember, these, this is all based on CP. So this has to be somehow immobilized. Uh, any fle really flexible signals would not show up here. And then you can recognize uh, a bunch of peaks now stemming from this extra glutamine uh, form, QC, which can, you can all connect together into a, a side chain and backbone assignment of the, this uh, semi-mobile surface-facing glutamine. And there's actually a second form here, this QD. So we have QC and QD. And um, we also see the PP2 prolines and the random coil prolines all showing up nicely in this spectrum. Um, if you compare that, for example, uh, to the prolines uh, without filtering, we see uh, the PP2 being the strong signal because it's they're more uh, immobilized. But when you go to the filtered state, you see now that actually the random coil becomes one of the dominant signals. So what you actually get here is you can suppress peaks that are close to uh, other peaks that you otherwise miss in the baseline. And you uh, also bias towards the more uh, dynamic uh, things on the surface. Now this actually, uh, this idea we, we got of quite a while back and, and Irina and I wrote uh, back then already a, uh, a review article that talks about, yeah, using this invisibility uh, as a trick to do uh, spectral editing. I mean, of course, people have talked about this many, many times and uh, I've used all sorts of interesting applications of dynamics-based spectral editing. And so we just try to summarize this in this article, which we hope is, uh, is useful and touches upon a lot of the stuff that I talk about here, but also that uh, Anya uh, discussed earlier. 
Um, but basically the idea of course being that you can lose signals in the preparation, the CP or in-app transfer, and you can integrate as we did here, a really specific uh, step that does the dephasing, like our case of dip shift experiment. Uh, what I of course shouldn't skip, and I know Jochem is here in the audience, and he may be thinking this already, that uh, back in uh, 2019, uh, Lynn Marie Thompson with Jochem and, and, and other co-authors published effectively a very similar experiment, or you could say the same experiment based on uh, using uh, carbon nitrogen interactions to um, dephase a, a DAR experiment, and you get the same, uh, same principle. Um, and I think that's basically what I wanted to talk about, aside from uh, once again mentioning that uh, basically almost all of the work that I talked about, the, at least the PolyQ work was done by Irina Matlahov with here also um, uh, some support from uh, Jennifer Boats, uh, also still in Pittsburgh. And I mentioned the work by uh, Mustafa on the polysaccharides. Uh, with more coming forward out of that. And uh, here we have also uh, a lot of technical support from Alessia La Sorsa uh, here in the group. And this work was uh, funded, or our PolyQ work is originally funded by NIH, but it's now also uh, supported by the CHDI, uh, the European Huntington Network, and the campaign team Huntington, which are uh, uh, global European and Dutch Huntington uh, funding organizations. And um, yeah, for people that are interested in PolyQ stuff, uh, I can mention that we have an upcoming uh, online networking event. If people are interested in that, I, I can contact me and I can give more information. And I welcome any question that people may have. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Patrick, uh, for a very nice presentation. Um, and are there questions? Let me see. Well, none yet. So, uh, <clears throat> so how long did you mix in the? I mean, in the dip shift to to do the suppression? Did, did you say I mean, it was that was about 0.2 uh, milliseconds of uh, really? mixing? So, if you look at the the dephasing curve, so this is with the R18 sequence. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. You we did. we hit the uh -huh. zero point close to um, 0.2 milliseconds. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so in this case, that you find that then the signals are just just about negative for the rigid uh, parts of the fiber, but um, uh, you can of course tweak it so that you get them exactly zero. Yeah. So <clears throat> you know, so, some time ago, Chris Geroniak and John Lansing did a, a filtering experiment like this on bacterial adoption mm -hmm. uh, to basically filter out all the glutamines and the backbone nitrogens to look at the aspartic acid side chains. Yeah. Uh, so there was a there was a, a redor <clears throat> filtering um, experiment and uh, it allowed us yeah it allowed us to measure you know some carbon carbon distances and uh, but it's it's the same the filtering idea is really good when you have things now these were rigid samples more rigid samples than what you have you're you're, you're doing something uh, really a little bit different but uh, <clears throat> the filtering is a good idea in many cases. Uh, Kong, do you have any questions? For... Uh, I just just a quick question. So like, um, so I, I see that there, there are not too many points. So is it like sampling with respect to the rotor period, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, that's the because for this R sequence, this was spinning at uh, 10 kilohertz. Uh -huh. Then right. we increment every one rotor period. Okay. Um, so we are also trying other uh, recoupling schemes so that you have more flexibility in that. But um, that's what we, we did in this case, um, partially because that's how we started off measuring these dipolar couplings in our previously published work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was, just, I was just seeing like, it would be, it would be, it would be much nicer if you have more points in the beginning to track the defaces. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that was sort of, I mean, that this was our starting point and uh, we are working on uh, mm -hmm. trying to get that just uh, optimized. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't see any other questions and we're now at about, uh, well, 1215 already. Uh, so I'd like to again, thank both of our speakers today uh, for really beautiful talks, beautiful presentations on 
interesting new new systems. A lot of, as I said, a lot of new NMR methodology as well as new uh, <clears throat> biochemistry and biophysics. So Anya and Patrick both, uh, thank you very, very much. And Kong, do you want to mention the upcoming uh, seminar in two weeks? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So like in two weeks, uh, 12th of April, uh, we'll be hosting Stefan's talk from University of Washington, who will probably tell us something about EPR, as well as Rachel Martin from UC Irvine. Um, I'm not sure, maybe she'll tell us something about probe or 3D printer stuff or, or some biomolecular NMR applications. Okay, so again, uh, thank you both. It's great to see you uh, on Zoom, and maybe we will see you this summer at the ICMRBS. And hopefully uh, next week in a, or in two weeks, we'll be back here uh, with some more presentations. So thanks again. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.